Right, well, if you have a Bible, open up to Mark 16 for that section that Patty just read, and you could uh, pull out your sermon outline as well. Uh, today's sermon's going to be a little more detailed than some other sermons I've given, so the outline has a little more detail on it as well to maybe help you uh, to follow along. Um, I was trying all week to figure out how to get across in the scripture reading that there is some uncertainty about uh, whether this section of scripture was originally in Mark, and it was either going to be uh, what Patty did, or it was going to be having her say, this is the word of the Lord, question um, mark, which is an Anchorman reference for men of a certain age. All right. Um, so where did you get your Bible? Like, where'd you get your Bible? Amazon, I think, probably. Christianbook.com. If you're maybe a sentimentalist, you, you got it from a, a family member or a, maybe when you were confirmed as a child or something. Uh, maybe you'd answer that question by just saying, I, I assume from China, they print all the Bibles now, right? Which is hilarious to my grandparents' generation. Um, no, seriously, where'd your Bible come from? Like, where, where, did, where did this come from? How did we get this? Where, where'd your Bible come from? That's what we're going to talk about today. If someone were to say to you, don't you know that you're, what you have as your Bible today is just a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy riddled with errors and mistakes that's been passed down uh, like a game of telephone until it's so uh, confused from the original version that we have no idea what the original book of Mark or Romans said. How would you respond to that person? Or a YouTube video that claimed that or somebody on TikTok who said that. How would you be able to correct someone or confront someone who had that viewpoint? Well, that's what this, today's message is designed to help you with. And it's Probably different than any sermon you've heard me give or sermon I've given. I found out last week was my 500th different sermon here at Grace. And all the sermons before this have been an exposition of a passage resting on the assumption that this is God's word for us, then we want to hear it. Today's sermon is going to kind of get us behind that, right? Behind that reality and say, well, why do we know that this is God's word? As I considered how to end the Gospel of Mark series that we spent 56 weeks in together as a church, we've been reflecting on, I, I looked at a lot of other um, pastors who taught through Mark, and most of them just skip this part. They just they end with verse 8, and the series is over. Um, and I thought, you know, I wrestle with these questions a lot. Maybe you do too. And maybe this will help you have greater confidence in God's Word. So even though I, I'm of the opinion, just to show you from the get-go, that, that I don't think verses 9 to 20 were in the original version of the Gospel of Mark, I think talking about this, I hope it's going to really help your faith, help you have greater confidence in God's word, and help you uh, to, to have greater trust in what he has said to us. So how did we get the English Bibles in front of us today? Where, where did your Bible come from? Well, there's basically four steps to the process. First, Mark wrote it, or he wrote the Gospel of Mark. Obviously, the other writers wrote the other, rest of the New Testament. Scribes copied it down over the centuries, for about 14 centuries until the invention of the printing press. Uh, in the last few hundred years, scholars have gathered together all the manuscripts that the scribes wrote that they could find. And then the last step, uh, that consolidation of all those manuscripts were translated from the original languages into English, in our case, but Mandarin, Spanish, Vietnamese, other languages around the world. So let's talk about that. Uh, first step, Mark wrote his original autograph, is the, the technical word. We could say he wrote his original copy of the Gospel of Mark. And I've got bad news for you. No one knows where that is. That doesn't exist in any museum in Egypt or London or Paris or Jerusalem or anywhere. You can't go see the original book of Mark. You can't see the original book of Romans or the original book of Revelation or any of the New Testament autographs. There are no first editions in existence. They would be of unparalleled value if you could ever find one. It would make a great Indiana Jones movie. I recommend you start looking. Um, <laughs> But, but none of the original autographs still are in existence. Actually, the, the earliest section of any copy of any of the original books of the New Testament is from the early 2nd century. There's a section of the Gospel of John. It's just a little a scrap uh, that's in a museum that you can see. After that, the first full New Testament, the, the oldest full New Testament, comes from the 4th century. It's called the Codex Sinaiticus. Uh, there's another one from the 4th century called Codex Vaticanus, I worked really hard on saying that. I still didn't get it right. Um, and those are the, the earliest copies. And I just say that from the get-go to say that's not a conspiracy. That's just reality. Do I wish that we had the original autographed copy of Romans? Of course. Of course. That would be really helpful. Um, that would really assuage all these concerns about what was originally written down in the New Testament. But, but that's just in reality what we, we don't have that. 
What we do have is thousands and thousands and thousands of copies from all over the ancient world, from Armenia and Georgia, from Greece, from Macedonia, from Italy, from Egypt, all over the place. There are thousands and thousands of copies. And that's because uh, scribes by hand for centuries had to copy in order to proliferate and preserve the New Testament. Well, by proliferate, I mean they, they wanted to make copies available to other Christian communities. Now, when we think of Bibles as something that we own, like I have my own Bible, you probably have your own Bible. It's not a brag. If you don't have your own Bible, there's a shelf of them in the back. Please take one. We'd like you to have one as an individual. But that's a modern luxury. When we talk about the ancient world, books were held in community, right? They were, they were something that a church collectively would be very proud if they owned even just one of the New Testament books because it was so expensive and difficult to get. And so scribes were these well-paid, well-trained professionals who would copy uh, the New Testament books in order to proliferate them so other communities could have a copy of Romans or the letters of the Corinthians or 1 Peter and especially the Gospels. Um, these uh, books were written at first on what we call papyrus today. They were a papyrus plant that was weaved together and was pretty brittle, and so they would roll it into scrolls. And then by the third century, they discovered a way to use animal skins in what was called vellum, or, or we call it parchment sometimes today, and those could be bound into the shape of a book. That's where what's called a codex in, in nerd language. Um, and what we think of as a book today, it wasn't until uh, the introduction of paper from, from the East, from Japan and from China, uh, about a millennia later, that we started using what we think of as, as books in the Western sense with paper. Um, these scribes often were very pious in their faith, and they would write, uh, they saw their task as a sacred one, and they would write notes in the margins of their, uh, of their copies about what it was that they were saying. And so great care was often taken to proof check against the original and against one another, making sure that every word and letter was correct. Now, if you hear that, if you just hear that in like a little clip on YouTube or on social media, uh, didn't you know that for 14 centuries, they just copied copies of copies of copies of copies of copies? You'd rightly, or understandably maybe, be concerned. And you would think, oh, maybe there could be a lot of mistakes. I mean, when I copy something, I make mistakes. If, if I were to just read the Gospel of Mark to you guys right now in the room, and you were to all write down what I wrote, you'd probably make at least one or two mistakes of transmission. Why can we have confidence then that over 14 centuries until the printing press, that they didn't make mistakes? And that maybe this is all just like some sort of long game of telephone where it started off with, with this, and then it grew like a fish story over time. Well. That's where this concept of textual criticism comes in. Modern scholars have gathered manuscripts for centuries. I say modern, really it goes back to the time of Erasmus in the 16th century, have, have made it this goal to gather as many of these thousands of manuscripts as possible to try to figure out the, the tree, think of a family tree, but of books, and to see what goes back to the original and what was the first thing that was written down. And so what you can do, you can spend your career in this a field called textual criticism and you can learn about it at places like Talbot, where I went to seminary, or secular places like UCLA or USC. It's the same, same discipline. It's taught in the same way, whether you believe what the Bible is saying is true or not. How do we figure out what the original writer intended to say? And most of these, what are called textual variants, where the, the <coughs> manuscripts disagree with each other, are over really mundane and boring things and small things like maybe the spelling of a name or uh, a transposing of one or two letters or insertion of a, an extra word that's unnecessary here or there or the missing of a preposition. It's not some big conspiracy to, to grow new doctrines or to eliminate people from history. It's usually just a, a more mundane effort to try to make sure that the spelling is the same and, and that uh, the writing is the same throughout the manuscripts. The result of all these efforts to gather these manuscripts is in a consolidated book called the, the Nessel Allen New Testament. It's colloquially what it's called, it's the Novum Testamentum Graeci in, in Latin, but it's called the Nessel Allen for English speakers. And I got a copy, anyone who learns Greek, I think I bought my first copy when I was at UCLA, so it's not a confessional thing. Um, you can see all the textual variants that are there. Uh, 
that's the attempt from scholars to try to say this is what we think the original author was writing. And then from that Novum Testamentum Greekai, they translate it into whatever language that they're using. Every once in a while, I'll hear someone say, there's been so many translations. There's translations of translations of translations. How could we ever ha know what the original writer meant? Well, that's actually not true. It's not that we have grandchildren of grandchildren. It's that each new translation goes back to the original Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew in order to give a new and fresh translation. And that's true, again, whether you're talking about the English Standard Version that we usually use here, or the NIV, or the NASB, or the New Living Translation. Any of these translations has the same approach, to go back to the original manuscripts, go back to the original languages, and retranslate because language changes over time. Um, there's one translation that doesn't do that, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, and that's the King James and the New King James Version. We'll talk about those and why in a while, because I want to get angry emails this week. All right, so that's a long introduction to say, well, how does this, what does this have to do with Mark's ending? Why are we talking about this now? I suppose this is helpful anytime, but, but why are we talking about it today? Well, because there's two times, and only two times in the New Testament, where there's a whole paragraph that's contested about whether it was in the original. Usually I said it's a, a spelling thing or a one-word thing here or a two-word thing here. Um, there's two times where it's a whole paragraph where the manuscripts don't agree on whether it was in the original or not. One is our passage from today, from the end of Mark, and the other one's from John 8, a very beloved passage about the woman caught in adultery and let he who is without sin cast the first stone. We'll have to talk about that when we get to the Gospel of John. Uh, I love that passage. I hope it was in the original, even if it probably wasn't. Uh, this other one, though, is what our passage is for today, which is Mark 16. And so why is Mark's ending uh, contested? And the short answer is because some manuscripts have it and some don't. And trying to choose which manuscripts to prioritize is tricky and it's complicated. Um, you could do it a couple different ways. One way you could choose to decide whether it was original is just count, just have democracy and say, well, which, which one has a majority? And is it in more or not? And we'll just go whichever one has more. Well, that would be overwhelmingly a case for including it because over 95% of the manuscripts have Mark 16, 9 to 20. The problem is it's not that simple because as anyone who's done any sort of family diagramming can attest, sometimes there's a part of the family line that dies out and then another part that becomes very voluminous. And just because there is 800 grandkids on this side and no grandkids on this side doesn't mean that these two weren't both brothers at the beginning. Does that make sense? The same thing happens in the textual tradition because of something that happened historically. In the fourth century, uh, Christianity becomes legal for the first time. Most of the scribes who have been uh, transmitting the New Testament up until the fourth century have been doing so often at great personal risk because of their commitment to Christ. Now, all of a sudden, Christianity is legal. And so by the late fourth century, the Pope, or the guy we call the Pope now, the Bishop of Rome, um, decides that he would like there to be an official Latin translation of the Bible, of the New Testament, for uh, the people under his jurisdiction in Rome. I totally get that. We want an English Bible because we speak English. They wanted a Latin Bible because they spoke Latin. And so he commissions a very godly and brilliant man, uh, Jerome, now known as St. Jerome, um, to translate first the Gospels and then the whole rest of the Bible for him. And Jerome's brilliant. He travels all around the world to do this. He takes this job really seriously. He goes to, moves to Jerusalem in order to learn Hebrew so he can translate the Old Testament. He finds all the manuscripts he can. He, he does an incredible job, and he translates what's now known as the Vulgate. Um, maybe you've heard of the Vulgate. It becomes the official uh, Bible of the Catholic Church from about 389 to uh, when uh, the Va Second Vatican Council happened in the 1960s, during some of your lifetime. Um, and so his translation, this official translation, the Vulgate, becomes the de facto official manuscript tradition for the Catholic Church. Do you understand why that would happen? Right? So Jerome takes all the manuscripts he can, figures out what he thinks is original. He says, this is my best attempt. This is my best attempt to figure out what's original. He writes it down. And then, because that's the official version, everyone who transmits uh, Greek manuscripts after that defaults to that part of the family tree, whether that was the original or not. And so that becomes known as the Byzantium 
family of manuscripts, and over 95% of manuscripts from the 7th century and the 9th century and the 10th century all come from that tradition. The problem is the two oldest manuscripts that are in any museums uh, in the world, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, don't come from that part of the family tree, and they don't have this longer ending of Mark. And in fact, Jerome himself wrote that he didn't, most of the manuscripts he consulted did not include the longer ending of Mark, but that he included it for the same reason that scribes tended to make a lot of textual mistakes, is that he was scared of leaving anything out. He didn't want to be the guy to eliminate something out of the Bible. Um, and so even though he had a lot of concerns that was in the original, he included it. By the way, this happens all the time with textual variants. Uh, uh, say a scribe's looking at two manuscripts, and one says Jesus, and the other one says Christ, and he doesn't want to leave out Jesus or Christ. They both seem important. So he writes down Jesus Christ. And then he, the next guy comes along, and he says, well, it says Jesus Christ here. And then this other one says, Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, that seems, Lord seems important. And so he writes Jesus Christ our Lord. And so one of the rules of textual criticism is, whatever is shorter is more likely to be original, because scribes tended to add things rather than want to leave them out. That, that same mistake I understand that mistake. It's a very pious mistake to make, but it leads to these longer readings. And um, I mentioned the King James. Here we go. The King James is the most important translation in English history. It solidified the English language. It is an amazing gift from God to us, but it rests on a very antiquated group of biblical texts, uh, of, of biblical manuscripts. Um, when it was revised, first in the authorized standard version in the early 20th century, and later the revised standard version in the mid-20th century, the translators took out a lot of those reduplications. So they went back to whatever they thought the original was. So Jesus Christ our Lord in the King James becomes Jesus, because that's probably more likely in the textual version. And a bunch of churches like ours, more evangelical conservative churches, went into an uproar, <laughs> and they said, you're taking out the deity of Christ. You're taking out, in, in reference to our part in Mark 16, you're taking out the resurrection of Jesus. It's because you don't believe in those things. No, 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 that's not the reason. And so we're trying, it's that we believe in the doctrine of the word of God and that it really matters what was originally written down. All right, so we've talked about the Vulgate. We've talked about my emails. Uh, we've talked about Jerome. Let's talk about this passage in particular. All right, I, I don't want you to miss the forest for the trees on this. If you, at the end of this, come to the conviction that you think Mark 16 was original scripture, maybe in spite of what I say or for other reasons, or you just see the evidence differ differently, God bless you, God be with you. You're not alone in church history. A lot of Christians have come to that conclusion. Uh, in fact, Irenaeus, the great theologian of the second century, he, he saw this as part of the original Version of Mark. So this was, there was an early belief among at least a few Christians, or some Christians, that this was to be part of Scripture. So I'm, I'm not trying to pick a fight with, with anyone. I, I am saying, though, that it really matters what was in the Bible and that we need to think about this carefully. Nothing in the longer ending of Mark is going to change your faith. Nothing in whether you adopt it or not is going to change what we believe as Christians. What does the longer ending of Mark teach? Same things the rest of the Gospels teach. That Jesus was raised from the dead on the third day, as he said he would, that he appeared to his followers, that uh, he commissioned them to go to the nations and proclaim the Gospel, and that salvation was necessary for everyone on earth. Does that sound like Matthew, Luke, and John? Of course it does. Do you know why? Because he's taking stuff out of Matthew, Luke, and John, or, or whoever's writing this, the unknown editor, is borrowing almost every verse in this section from other Gospels either verbatim or in summary. And because of that, a lot of the language in this long running of Mark is unique to this part of Mark. You may have noticed as we've gone through this series that Mark loves the word and, it's the Greek word chi. He uses it at the start of every section and often sentence after sentence, he says, and then this, and then this, and then this. He doesn't do it at all in this section. He changes uh, the pronoun out of nowhere from talking about a woman to talking about a man. He changes the geography of what's happening. He changes, uh, redund he reintroduces characters we've already met. There, there's all these reasons to think that whoever's inserted this material from the ending of Mark is a different writer than who had written the rest of the gospel. Now, does this change what we think Mark is teaching? Of course not, but it seems like someone wants there to be more 
in the ending of Mark. And I get that. It does seem like an abrupt ending, doesn't it? Just Jesus is raised. We don't see him. The angel tells him, tells the women, go away. He's not here. He's raised, as he said. And then the book ends. One pastor who I, I really respect at the end of a series on Mark said, I can't, I can't in good conscience preach verses 19, 9 to 20, so we'll just preach the resurrection from Matthew instead. And he's doing the same thing that the, this editor of Mark is. We, we want to see more of the resurrection of Jesus. We really cherish that, and that's important for us. But that doesn't mean we should change what was written in the original book of Mark. All right, let's talk about the weird theology, though, that's in Mark's ending. As much as I want to downplay it and be like, it's just the same, it's just all the same stuff, you'd be like, Bob, there's stuff in here about poisons and snakes. That's weird. That's just weird. That's not in John. I hope it's not in John. Um, Please don't bring out a snake right now. Uh, And that's verses 17 and 18. That's probably the most uh, well-known part of the longer ending of Mark. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. So um, this has created uh, some interesting interpretations in the Western church, especially in the American church over the last 150 years, especially among people who I'm going to just choose to believe that, that they really cherish their relationship with Christ, and they really want to have confidence that God's word is true, and they want to show confidence that God's word is true, and they feel like the best way to do that is to do what these verses say, to handle snakes without getting hurt. And uh, I, mean, I haven't heard of any of them drinking poison, but, but the snake handling thing has become very popular, as well as the, the speaking in new tongues. Um, this is rooted in, uh, or it co-occurs with a belief that King James is the only translation you should use. And while the ESV and the NIV and the NASB and the NLT all set aside a section and say, hey, this is probably not in the original manuscripts, the King James includes it just as if it was the rest of Mark. And so because of that, you have snake handling in the American South, you have it used as a test of faith, and you have predictable and unfortunate, I shouldn't call them accidents, consequences of that sort of activity. So what do we do with that? What's on the line theologically over this ending of Mark? Well, let me start with what's not on the line, right? The resurrection of Jesus is not on the line, whether you think Mark's longer ending is original or not. The mission of Christ is not on the line, going to the ends of the earth. The deity of Christ, the the significance of salvation, none of those things are on the line. What is on the line, really, is this question that we started with of where do we get our Bibles from, and how do we know that this is God's word, and how can we have confidence in it? And there's a couple different ways to answer that, right? The Catholics answer it in 385 by just endorsing Jerome's translation and saying, Jerome's translation is the word of God because the church says it's the word of God. And we could do that, right? We could just say that the authority of the church determines the authority of scripture. That's that's the Catholic doctrine, as, as I understand it. But as Protestants, that hasn't been what we've done since the time of Martin Luther. We've said scripture is self-attesting, that, that it defends itself, that scripture is self-evidently true, that it doesn't require the doctrine of the church to endorse it. But underneath that doctrine is the assumption then that it has to be the original manuscripts uh, that are themselves inspired, and that God is faithful to transfer and to transmit those manuscripts to us in the Bibles that we have today. So, where did you get your Bible from? I gave you a pretty long and, let's be honest, academic answer today. And I, I, I threw a lot at you, and you guys have been great at listening to it and hopefully processing through it with you. But I think if you were to give a short answer to where you got your Bible from, you got it through a faithfully transmitted process where God has seen to it that we can understand his word rightly in what is true and good for us today. Now, um, if you see this differently... If you want to study on this more, or if you just like to learn more, that strikes a chord with you, I would really encourage you to, to dig into this. Because I think one of the reasons we can be confident that this is God's word is because there is a lot of transparency over the manuscript tradition that we, re, that we rely on. Um, there's a scholar from Dallas Seminary named Dan Wallace who founded something called the Study for the Center of New Testament Manuscripts where he leads a team that seeks to digitize and photograph every manuscript, the tens of thousands that are out there in the world, so that scholars everywhere can study them. 
And I know that sounds like a very nerdy thing, but I think it has a lot of apologetic value for us. As evangelicals who believe in the power of Scripture, we should be the first ones to show everyone all these manuscripts that are out there, not trying to hide the fact that there's some spelling mistakes. And even in the case of this longer ending of Mark, there's a, there's a paragraph disputed. Because at its core, there's a lot of reasons to have confidence and trust that God uh, has given us his word that has been faithfully transferred down through the generations and that we can know it and as a result know him today. All right. Well, I was hoping to do some time reflecting on the end of Mark today, um, and we're out of time. So here's, here's my encouragement for you. Those of you guys who have been here at Grace this last year, we've spent 56 weeks in this book. You spent a lot of time thinking about Mark's gospel. And so I would encourage you this week to, to reflect on that and to sort of think about what do you want to take away from Mark's gospel as a whole? For me, the thing that st- stood out to me as I thought about that question this week is about how this is really the gospel of the Son. You know, it begins with G- Jesus being introduced as the Son of God. All throughout the book, there's people proclaiming him as the Son of Man, the Son of David. Ultimately, on the cross, the centurion says, truly, this was the Son of God. That's really, for me, what I want to take away, that, that Jesus was who he said he was, that his mission and purpose, uh, he came to earth for a mission and a purpose, and that is so that we might know him and that the world might know him. What about for you? What do you want to take away from this book as we close? Let's pray together. God, I pray for my friends who are here who uh, wrestle with a lot of doubts about these issues, and they have a lot of questions about them, and maybe those questions have been shut down by people in their lives. Um, maybe they uh, sort of expressed those doubts in a way that uh, did not, was not met with a lot of care and love and respect in the past. And they're not sure what to do with questions they have about your word or about whether you really are there or really care for them. God, I pray that uh, through your spirit and through us here as a community, we would be a, a place where people can ask those questions and find truth and find uh, people who care about them and, and help them to, to even help us learn more about who you are and what is real in the world. God, we're grateful for your word. We're grateful that we can learn about it. We're grateful that uh, we are the beneficiary of so many generations and centuries of scribes and men and women who uh, gave a great deal in order to ha- help us have the scriptures. May we be faithful to know them and through them to know you. In Christ's name we pray, amen.